Well, I would like to tell you the story of my crown this morning. So back three or four weeks ago, we went to see uh, several family members that live over in the Chicago, Milwaukee area. My sister actually lives in Milwaukee. And we were driving up, I think, on a Friday night. We were going to stay the night with her. And we drove by the Cheese Castle on I-94, just over the, uh, the, uh, the uh, state line into Wisconsin. There. Has anybody ever seen it or know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever been there? Okay, it's a good thing I'm sharing this story. So I saw this off to the side. It said the Cheese Castle. And I said to my wife, I said, I want to go to the Cheese Castle. And like she often does, she just looked at me like, you're so weird. And we just kept driving on. And so we went on to the uh, Wisconsin there. And we were coming back, coming south on 94 there. And we were a little bit early to meet my daughter, Lindsay. And I said to Kel, I said, this is my opportunity. I've been wanting to do this. I am going to the Cheese Castle. Now, it sounds a little cheesy, right? And uh, cheesy in, in more than one way. Like, really, there's a business called the Cheese Castle. It's actually like an upscale kind of market. It's pretty nice, and there's this one room that's nothing but cheese, and, and you could sample the cheese, and I did that. And uh, there's also another room that has a throne on it. I, I took a picture of myself. Some of you saw that in our Wednesday email. But when we were checking out, I realized that they had these crowns. And I'm like, oh, I want one of these crowns. And my wife is like, oh, gosh, you know, why does he have to be with me? And I think she would have switched to another register, except she hadn't taken her purse inside. So I had the money. So she was checking out and buying this stuff, and I had the money. And I'm like, I said to the, the cashier, I said, I want one of those crowns. And Kelly's like, <laughs> and I picked it up, and I tried to put it on. I said, oh, but it's not big enough. And the cashier was on my side, and she was like, oh, I can help you with that. And so she actually made it bigger, and so this thing fits perfectly now. So, yes, so I am, I am Lord of the Cheese. That's my official, uh, and my wife is taking a picture of me right now. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. But you know what? When we were growing up, there's a good chance that you heard a fairy tale and you thought, oh, it would be so great to be the king or so great to be the queen. And, and if you're honest, it would be like, that sounds like so much fun, right? Because then you could feel important and then you could be, uh, have prestige and then you could be the boss, and the king or the queen gets to be the boss, and they get to be in charge. And everybody gets, or everybody has to do what they say. And so this morning, this is, I'm just telling you, okay, if I really were the king, this is what I would decree. So first of all, I would decree that if I were the king, I would give kids every Friday off school. Yeah, so the kids are going to be on my side. And you know what, parents, we'll give you Friday off too, okay? We're just going to a four-day week uh, if, if I'm the king. Secondly, if I'm the king, I'm adding popcorn to the lobby for church, okay? If you guys can have coffee before the church, all of you like coffee, I can have my popcorn, right? And uh, be, How many are in favor of popcorn in the lobby? Okay, if I'm the king, I'm getting a little bit of a following here. I'm also, maybe some Mountain Dew, maybe we could get like a little fountain thing there where you pick your own... All right, that's, that sounds good. I'm also thinking maybe in the auditorium we could have heated seats. My wife has though in her car, in, in her car, and every chance I get, I steal her car in the wintertime because it feels so good. I'm also thinking this, John, uh, that I'd make it stop snowing at the end of February, okay? Winter ends at the end of February. I love snow, but it needs to know its place. Um, and I'm, this is my other one. I, I'm going to take away everybody's phone, and I'm going to make you talk to people. Okay, I'm out now. Nobody wants me to be the king. But the thing is, we want to be the king or we want to be the queen because we want to have power. Because we don't like the feeling of being powerless. And we don't like being at the mercy or the direction of somebody else. We don't like being told what to do. And my question this morning is, have you ever felt powerless? Have you ever felt like you were in a situation where you had no control over it? Or maybe you felt like you were in a relationship where it was just going in a direction and there's nothing that you could do about it, and you have felt powerless. And I bring up that question this morning because I think that may be what the queen felt like, Queen Esther, powerless. Which seems a little bit ironic, doesn't it? That the queen would be powerless, and yet 
I think that's the case. At least that was the case for Esther because she really had no agency in her life. She was just pretty much forced to do things, just to, supposed to do things that she was told, and she just kind of had to go along with things. And a lot of those things that she had to go along with weren't exactly positive things because she didn't have any power. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at that issue. When you feel powerless... As we look at the life of Esther, and I want to just do a quick review of what we looked at in, in last week's episode of, of When God Saved the Queen. But the king in Persia at that time was Xerxes. He threw a big party to impress everybody, and everybody got drunk. But the king, drunk along with all of his guy friends, said, you know what would be fun is let's have the queen come in here and stand before us because the queen was, was very beautiful, and that way the, the king could be very proud of himself, and everybody could be jealous of, of this beautiful woman who was hanging on his arm. Well, uh, Vashti took one look at that. She was the queen and said, you know what? I have no interest in that whatsoever. She refused to come in when the king commanded her to come in. And so she was banished from the kingdom. And the king got together with his buddies, and they made a rule that all of the women had to respect their husbands. Well, I kind of blew that off a little bit last week because it sounded a little bit funny to me. Like, okay, let's make a rule that all the women, if you have to make a rule, it, it, it seems like you might be a little bit weak. But in going back and looking at that story, I'm not sure that I totally caught what was going on there. So this law, and we can't prove this, but there's some speculation here. This law may have been the opportunity that these men grabbed to actually assert their power even further. And so I looked at it as kind of like, ah, oh, you know, whatever, you're in charge. Is it gave permission to them for them to go back to their wives and to, if this is possible, treat them even more like property than what they already had. It gave them permission to be more repressive and more oppressive. And it may have actually legitimately made things worse for the women in Persia. And so it basically it just weaponized and it armed these men to go back and do whatever because women, there's nothing they could do about it at that point. And so that law may have been a very serious thing. Well, the story went on there from where we talked last week, and, and uh, Xerxes, without a queen now, decided he needed a queen, so he decided to have a, um, a pageant. I don't know if that's the best way to, to call it, but a plan to bring in all the unmarried uh, young women and to actually um, interview for the queenship. Of course, it wasn't really an interview. They were actually required to come in one by one and to sleep with the queen, and that was his process for choosing the next queen. And if that seems disturbing, it's very disturbing. And Esther got recruited to do that. And Esther, in that society, my guess is that they went out there, they found all the beautiful women, and nobody really got a choice. Now, maybe for some of the girls, it was like, oh, this is a great opportunity. Maybe I can be the queen someday. Maybe I can have power. It didn't really work that way. But I'm wondering, and if I have to step back and even look at it again from after talking about it last week, I doubt that Esther had much opportunity to say, no, I don't want to do that. It was maybe like the, the, you know, the soldiers showed up with, I don't think they had guns at that time, but with spear or, or whatever in hand and said, you're going. And she really didn't get much choice, and so she was actually forced into that situation. Now, we're told that Esther was a very charming young lady. In fact, several times in chapter 2, it says that she had gained people's favor. And so she was selected by the, the king, hopefully for more than j just her physical uh, beauty and, and more for that than just that night. But we talked about last Sunday how the culture of that day was so abusive and exploitive of women and how it's actually very much like us today. And I asked this question last week, well, why didn't Esther just say no? And the more I study this and the more I look at this, and there's some questions that were raised that people even asked me last week afterwards, I'm not sure that she had much choice. I'm not sure that she had that agency. And we asked some questions of her, and I'm like, well, maybe you think it through those answers. Try to put yourself in her shoes. I mean, she was probably a teenager at this time. And the king and his army shows up. How much choice did she have? We asked, why are you eating the special food, Esther? Well, she's eating the special food because her uncle who raised her, Mordecai, was saying, 
you can't let anybody know that you're a Jew here because that could be dangerous. And so she was just following along with what she had been told there. Why is she sleeping with, with this king or marrying a pagan? I don't know that she had a choice because she's pretty much powerless. And as we look at that story and we saw that story, her uncle Mordecai was out there pacing at the palace gates. And I don't think it was because he was curious and hopeful. I, I wonder if it was because he was so scared of what was going to happen to this girl that he was supposed to be in charge of. And so I've had to step back this week and say, okay, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I got that a little bit wrong. And maybe Esther was way more uh, you know, under pressure here than what we could have even realized. And so... Maybe that wasn't just she was complicit in the situation as much as she was like it was happening to her. And what did she do about it? And I have to think, and especially as we go on in the story, that she had to feel incredibly helpless and powerless in this situation. And I say that, and I come back and review this too, because maybe you found yourself in one of those moments in your life where you really didn't have power, where you really were trapped, where you really were exploited, and there was nothing that you could have done about it. And even as you look back, you blame yourself and say, well, I should have done this or I should have done that. Maybe. And maybe you didn't really have as much as an option as you think. I just say that to say that God gets it, that God knows what it's like for people to be powerless, and that God has been in your story. And so I want to be clear. That as I stand here and as we look at this story here this morning, I am 100% against the exploitation, the objectification, the sexualization of women. It's prevalent in our culture and it's wrong. And we as a church need to stand against it. We as a church here at Waterford, but we as a church collectively. And sadly, sometimes women have been abused and misused in our churches as well. And so we want to stand against any person or ministry who minimizes, misuses, manipulates, or takes advantage of women in any way, or anybody who uses women to satisfy their lust for power, which is what Xerxes did here. And I want to be clear in standing with any person who's experienced the pain of victimhood. And I don't want to come across as insensitive or questioning you. I want to say, here, I'm on your side. And as we look at this story here, in, in Esther, as I'm starting to understand that, I think there is an element here where Esther was very much victimized, and yet God took her story and said, you know what, I can still do something with this. And that's where we get to today. And I realize that was a really, really quick review, and I apologize for it being so sudden and quick, but that gets us to where we're going today, and that's in chapter 2, verse number 19. We stopped at verse number 18 last week. But the story as we go on here is the story of Esther where God saved the queen, but it's a story for the powerless. So if you're in a situation right now where you are like, ah, I don't really know if I have power, or maybe you've been in a situation where the power was taken from you, this story is for you. And so as we look at these verses here, what we do in verse number 19, or, or, or as we go on here, is we introduce one more character. Last week we introduced the characters of Esther uh, and Xerxes and Mordecai, which were three of, the fa three of the four main characters of the book. The fourth one we get introduced to this week. We also are going to discover the primary conflict of the book. And then we're going to look at five dialogues, and for lack of a better term, I call them dialogues, but they're interactions between two people. Two people in the story, uh, two, we'll take two of the main characters, and as we read through here, we see five different interactions with these two characters, so you can kind of have a handle on where we're going here. So if you'll read with me, we're in Esther chapter 2, verse number 19, and really do encourage you to follow along, because to tell this story, we really have to read a lot of this story. But here is, is, is what it says next. When the virgins were assembled the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Verse number 20. But Esther had kept, her, uh, kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. And that's an parenthetical there. It's like in parentheses, that verse. But it actually becomes important, and it emphasizes a bit of a point there, that Esther just because was expected to do what she was told to do. Verse number 21. 
During the time that Mordecai, her uncle, was sitting at the king's gate, Big Thana in Terrace, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway became angry and conspired to assassinate the king, Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot, and he went and he told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, and, he, and she gave credit to Mordecai. And when the report from Esther was investigated and found out to be true, the two officials were executed, and this story was recorded in the history books of the annals in the presence of the king. And there's this weird little anecdote of this weird little episode that doesn't seem to be connected to anything, except it matters later in the story. Well, then we get to chapter 3. It says, after these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. And we're introduced to the fourth major character here, and it's a guy by the name of Haman. And he's the antagonist of the story, or really the villain of the story. And if it's possible, he's actually worse than Xerxes the king. He is he's the worst of the worst. And he is introduced into the story. And the king has chosen him now to be number two in the kingdom over everybody else. Now, here's an interesting question. Mordecai is the guy who's just rescued the king, or saved the king. So why does Haman get the promotion? Seems like Mordecai maybe should have got the promotion because he was the one who was looking out for the king. We don't have any idea why that is the case. Have you ever been in that situation? Maybe. And it leaves you feeling a little powerless, doesn't it? Well, we go on to our second interaction here. It's between Mordecai and Haman. Verse number two, all the uh, chapter, what are we on here? Chapter three, verse number two. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman. For the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. And we don't think this was actually a spiritual conviction. Because the king would have come in and out of that gate and, and Mordecai would have been expected to bow to the king too. And probably did. It was Haman that he didn't bow down to. Because there's a little bit of a personal issue going on between Mordecai and Haman. And actually it's very possible that Haman was a descendant of Agag. That's why he's called an Agag. Agag? I can't say that word. The son of Agag, who was the king of the Amalekites, and they were arch enemies of the Jews. And so there may have been a little personal animosity going on between these two guys. Anyhow, verse number three. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. I think that's a little ironic, isn't it? That Haman walks through the gates and evidently has his chin so much and nose so much up in the air that he doesn't even realize that, that Mordecai is not bowing to him. But it's also a little ironic here, too, that Mordecai had told them at the end of the verse there that he was a Jew. And why is that ironic? Because he's been telling Esther the whole time, don't tell anybody you're a Jew, don't tell anybody you're a Jew. And now he's saying, hey, by the way, I'm not bowing down because I'm a Jew. And that becomes a major factor in this story. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel to him or pay him honor, he was enraged. And having learned who Mordecai's people were, the Jews, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of the Jews throughout the entire kingdom. And we have a very cunning man here who sees not only Mordecai as a threat, but he sees all of Mordecai's people as a threat because they're Jews. And again, it could go back to that fact that he comes from a people group that was very much anti-Jew at that time. So in the verse number 7, we have a really weird verse here, but verse number 7, in the 12th year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the poor, that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman, to select a day and month, and the lot fell on the 12th month, the month of Adar. And so here's what's going on in this verse. Haman has decided something needs to be done about Mordecai and something needs to be done about the Jews, and so they cast a lot, probably some form of dice, and they roll the dice to say, here's when we're going to do something about it. And they roll it, and it comes up 12s. And uh, they're on the first day of the month there, or the first month of the year, rather. And they're like, okay, we're going to deal with this in the 12th month. So there's like a year now to prepare for the extinction, extinction and extermination of the Jews. Well, what's really odd to me about this verse is the fact that it isn't 
even talked to the king about this yet. And so he's just assuming in his arrogance that the king will do whatever I say. So we're going gonna, gonna to wipe out the Jews here and the king will just go along with it. And he has that much chutzpah to, to do that. The other thing that's interesting about that is that the poor was the lot and the, the feast that celebrates this story that the Jews observe, even Orthodox Jews observed it last Monday and Tuesday, is called the Purim. It's from this little piece of the story right here where they cast the lots, which is a fascinating plot twist here. Casting the lots is what showing what, you know, chance and fate in this whole story is about the sovereignty of God. And so just a little irony there. So we move on to the third interaction here, the third dialogue. This one is between Haman and the king. So Haman goes in and he says to Xerxes, there's people out here in your provinces and they don't assimilate. They worship another god. They don't act like we act here as Persians. And they are a threat. Their customs, everything they do, they don't obey the king's laws. I'm not even sure that's true. But he says it's not in the best interest for the king to keep them. Let it, verse number 9, if it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them. And I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrator for the royal treasury. And so this is very clever. He doesn't mention who the people are. He doesn't mention Mordecai by name at all. He just says there's some people out there. They won't do what they're supposed to do. And we just need to get rid of them. And so um, the king's like, okay. By the way, that money there, 375 tons of silver is what that would equate to. Like that's a, like a huge fortune. And speculation is that it would have been the plunder from going and killing all the Jews taking all of their money and bringing it back to the king. It, that's just one guess. But anyhow, Haman makes this request, and here's how the king answers. The king answers by asking him several questions about who these people are, what, whether this would be a good idea or not. Should they do this? How would this affect the kingdom? Not at all. He just says, oh, okay. And he takes the ring from his finger, and he gives it to Haman, and says, keep the money and do whatever you want to do. And so he delegates his authority, asks no questions, does no research. And what he does is he signs off on the execution of the queen without ever realizing it. And so the word goes out to the kingdom that all the Jews are going to be destroyed. And it's coming. It's not yet. It's coming, you know, several months down the road here. But all the Jews will be destroyed, killed, annihilated, is what verse number 13 says. In verse number 15, the couriers, the spokesmen went out, spurred on the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and the Haman sat down to drink. Hey, this is a great idea. This is going to be so, you know, awesome. And the rest of the kingdom is like, why are we after the Jews? What have they done? And there's no big reason for it here. And so everybody's confused. Well, we get to the next interaction here. This one's between Mordecai and Esther. So we're in chapter 4 now. Verse number 1. When Mordecai learned of everything that had been done, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, went into the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. Well, this feud between him and Haman had escalated now. And maybe he's wailing because he felt a little bit responsible. I don't know that that's the case. I'm sure he's wailing because he's realizing that all of the Jews are now set to be exterminated and wiped out. And so he's wailing, but he doesn't, verse number two, he doesn't go as far as the king's gate because no one in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict in order of the king came, there was great mourning. So all the Jews are mourning and they're laying in sackcloth and ashes because this was an irreversible law. In the law of the Medes and the Persians, maybe you've heard of this, when they made a law, it was good forever because the king was considered infallible. And so if he said it once, it had to be good forever. He could never make a mistake. So if that's what he said, that's what we go with. And so there's no appeal for this. So we have this law out there, and it's been put into play. And it's not like the Jews can stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, can we talk about this? It's a done deal. And so there's great weeping that goes on, including by Mordecai. And evidently, Esther's servants know the connection between them. And they say to Esther, hey, by the way, your uncle's out there like 
dressed in these sackcloths and just weeping and wailing, and what's the deal? And so Esther sends her messages out and says, hey, hey um, find out what's going on there. And so in verse number 6, Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai, I told him everything that had happened, including even the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury. And he gave them a copy of the text of the law for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain to her. And, and he told them to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and to plead with him for her people. And so this servant goes back and reports to Esther what, um, what Mordecai has said. Verse number 11, all the king's officials and people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being served of the king has but one law, they'd be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So that's actually Esther sending a message back to Mordecai. Sorry for the confusion there. But Mordecai says, you've got to go to the king, do something about this. And Esther's like, I can't. Because I have to be called into his presence. I can't just walk in there. If I walk in there and he doesn't acknowledge me, I'm dead. And, you know, I don't feel real good about just charging in there. I haven't seen him for a month. So I don't even know if I'm on the ins or the outs with the king. And that's the message that she sends back to Mordecai. He wants her to intervene. He wants her to do something. And she's like, I don't know about that. But then something changes in this story. And I don't want us to miss this, this next verse or two here. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer to her. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone will escape of all the Jews. For if you remain silent this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have been brought to your royal position for such a time as this. And that phrase right there, for such a time as this, is somewhat well known, and sometimes we use that, oh, for such a time as this. And it, it's, a, it's a great phrase, really. And, and, and the idea is that, that Mordecai is saying to Esther, hey, maybe God's put you in this place for this moment because you need to act and do something. And it's a challenge to all of us, too, that there are times in life where God has put us into these places in these situations, and we have our moments when we're being asked to step up and to do something. And I think that's a great point. But I don't really want to focus on that one this morning from that verse. There's another phrase in there that I think is interesting. Mordecai says, relief and deliverance will arise whether or not you do anything. Now, you, you won't be part of it, but, but God will still come through here. The Jews will still be spared but what he does in saying that is he ultimately puts the responsibility on God and takes the responsibility a little bit off of Esther there. So that's at least an encouraging phrase, but that's still not the phrase in that verse that jumped out to me as I read that. Here's the phrase that jumps out to me in this verse. He says, if you remain silent. If you remain silent. He's talking to the woman who's never been allowed to speak on her own behalf. In fact, we don't even see anything until verse 10 of the chapter there where Esther even speaks in this story. And so we have the first plot twist, and it's this, that the victim who didn't have a voice is now being asked to speak. Interesting, isn't it? She was never given that option. Things just happened to her, and she had to stay quiet. Up till now, choices have been made for her, and the choices aren't hers. And now, all of a sudden, she has been given this opportunity to speak up. And the victimized woman in this story is now asked to say something. Fascinating, isn't it? Well, we keep reading here. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. I go gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. 
And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and carried out all these instructions, but we see a second plot twist here. The person who's been without a choice is now given agency. She's never had a choice now, but Mordecai shows up and says, you got to do something. And now Esther gets to decide for herself. And I think it's interesting that she says, you know what, if I perish, I perish. Now I get to choose about what happens to me. And so she's never had a choice before, and she is given agency. She's free to act on her own. And what's really interesting right now is how the power dynamic shifts. Up until this point, Mordecai says, this is what we're going to do. And Esther says, okay. In this situation, Esther says, this is what we're going to do. And Mordecai says, okay. And there's a complete reversal of what happens there. And I love what she says. It's like, go back and fast, and we can add to that, probably pray. You know, we're going to need God's help here. But let's do this. And then there's a third plot twist that comes here. And it's the person, and this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, if you don't know the story of Esther, but the person with diminished value, the woman is asked to help and given a significant role. And where in chapter 1 the women had been pushed down in the kingdom, all of a sudden we see a woman being lifted up in this story. And that's where the story is going to go. And it's a huge plot twist as well. And she becomes not just this object or not just this tool or not just this person who's powerless. She becomes a person of consequence in this story. And so, Mordecai has said, hey, here's the rule, here's the law that the king has passed, and we're in big trouble here unless you do something, and it's up to you. And Esther says, okay, I have made my choice. If I die, I die. I'm okay with that. I need you to pray for me, and then you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk in before king. And we read that in chapter 5, verse number 1. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. And when he saw Esther standing in the court, ready to make her entrance, you got to come back next week to find out what happens next. And we'll pick up that story next week, and it goes well, okay? I don't want you fearing for Esther all week. It goes well. But I just want to finish this up this morning, and we see this reversal, and we see this person who is powerless, given this incredible power, this opportunity, this voice. And since she has a voice, I wonder what Esther might say to us this morning. And so as we conclude this morning, let me just suggest, maybe, maybe a half dozen, eight things here, that Esther might say to us. All right, here's the first one. If you have been wronged, God can still make things right. If you have been wronged, God can still make things right. Your story is not over. And now is your story not over. The pain that you've gone through was not missed by God. He didn't overlook it and he didn't poo-poo it. He knew all about it. Sometimes God allows the consequences of sin to play out, and sometimes there are innocent people who are swept along in its current. But God doesn't miss it. And God saw Esther, and God saw everything that happened to Esther, including even being an orphan, including being forced into to some form of sexual slavery, including not having a voice, and he didn't overlook that, and he said, you know what? Your story's not over. I can still make things right because God redeems stories and there's still hope for help and for healing. And I wonder if Esther would tell us that. Secondly, Esther might say, if you've been silenced, you can still find your voice. And maybe there's a situation right now where you continue to be silent and you're silent because of fear. Don't be afraid. Because you have a God who gives you a voice. And if you need to speak up, you may need to speak up and be brave. Or maybe you've observed something. And you know this is just not right. You have a voice. And this is a challenge to all of us to speak up and to share our voice. For those maybe around us. 
who have been silenced or maybe those around us who have had power taken away from them. That is our responsibility. And that is our re- opportunity to be the voice where somebody can't speak for themselves so that God can advocate for them. Thirdly, if you have been made to feel unimportant or if you have been valued only for what you can contribute, that's how Xerxes valued anybody, what can you do for me? If that's who you have been, let me assure you that you matter to God and you matter to his story. Our value is not found in what we do, what we contribute, and our value at the same time is not lost when things are taken away from us. Our value is given to us by God and it never changes and nothing can change it. No circumstance can change it. No relationship, nothing that you've been through can change that. You are loved and valued and you matter to God and you're still a part of his story. And let me tell you something else about his story. God loves underdogs. And if you've been made to feel like you don't matter or you have been made to feel like you're unimportant or you're made to feel like the only value you have is what you contribute or whatever like that, okay, you're still part of God's story. And God still cares desperately about you. And his story and your story are still going forward here. Next one. If you have been confused, know that God has been and is at work. And there are times in our stories where we're like, I really don't get what's going on here, God. And I wonder how many times Esther might have said that. Well, why my parents? Why would I have to lose them? Or, or why, you know, okay, I'm beautiful, but if I weren't beautiful, maybe I wouldn't have had to go through with this whole thing. Why, why did I get chosen for that? Or why did, all of these things, I wonder if, wonder if Esther wondered what's happening to me. And there are times when life does not make sense to us. And there are times when God's probably not going to bother to give us the details and he doesn't need to. And we're going to sit here and go, I do not get what's going on in my story. Let's just be assured of the fact that God is sovereign in our stories, even in the bad circumstances. And when God is silent, he's still not absent. And he knows where you are and he is concerned. And just be reminded that the last chapter hasn't been written yet. And so if you're confused right now, know that God is at work. Next, if you have been thwarted, God can still give you opportunity. The irony of this story is that the women who were pushed down at the beginning, are become a woman becomes the key player in this. And sometimes we, in our stories, say, you know what, I've been pushed down. I've, I've tried and I've been defeated. I've made attempts and, and I've been thwarted and I'm just going to give up. And maybe Esther would say to us, hey, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't put limitations on yourself that God hasn't put on you yet. And any man-made limitation that's been put on you, God's still more than big enough to overcome that. So if you've been thwarted, God can still give you an opportunity. Next, if you've been delayed, remember the story sometimes unfold slowly. This story that we're talking about right now that's going on here with Esther going before the king, we're somewhere four to seven years into this overall story. There's a lot of details that have been left out. And so for that period of time, Esther's probably been scratching her head, but I would just encourage you to be patient, especially if you're in the wait. And sometimes we have to wait a long time, and sometimes we may have to wait till eternity, but there's still a bigger story that's going on there. And if you're in the wait right now, don't panic, because sometimes the story unfolds slowly. If you've been rendered powerless, look for a step to take. And I find this interesting in this story. When all this stuff's going on with, with Esther, Mordecai is like, you're just going to have to deal with it. And finally, the stakes are so high that Esther's like, oh, we got to do something. And I don't know what to do, but the only idea I got is that you go talk to the king. But sometimes we look in these situations where it's like, I'm, I'm just powerless. Well, are you? Or is there still something that you might be able to do? 
It might be hard, it might be scary, it might be difficult, but can you take that step? And at the very least, and maybe this is the very most, notice what step Esther took first. Mordecai is like, hey, you need to go talk to the king. Esther's like, oh, how about if we talk to the king? And let's take this before God, before I ever go before the king. And if you're in a powerless situation, maybe you have a step to take. You can always take that step of taking it before the king. And then lastly, if you have been hurt or harmed, you can find hope in God. The story of Esther is the fact that God brings deliverance. And Esther, maybe it's going to be through you, but if you refuse, I'll still bring deliverance because that's what I do. And God brings deliverance in surprising ways, at surprising times with even surprising people. And maybe God will use some other person to bring deliverance to you, and maybe God will use you to bring that deliverance. So what do you do when you feel powerless? You realize who holds the power. It's not the king, Xerxes. It's not the oppressor, Haman. It's God himself. He holds the power, and he saves the queen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this story. It encourages us because so many times we feel powerless in our lives. And yet you step into our stories and you bring deliverance and you bring rescue and you bring help and you bring hope. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Let me just ask right now, do you have a situation where you feel powerless or maybe you look back to something in your past or you were victimized or, and you just relate to that. Can you find encouragement this morning in Esther's story? And maybe there's steps that you can take. Maybe it's just that simply looking out to God. Maybe it's just the encouragement that you need. She can have that conversation with God and say, God, thank you for your encouragement, but, but help me as I move from here, even in my story. And maybe you sit here this morning and you actually are powerless. One way that you're powerless is to do anything about your situation when it comes to sin. And anything about your situation when it comes to eternity because you have been misused and mistreated by the enemy himself, by Satan himself, who has brought sin and death into the story. And the only person who can rescue you is Jesus Christ, and that's why he died on the cross. That's why he offers forgiveness for sins. He died for him. And maybe you need deliverance this morning through Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to look to him. Simple conversation, a simple prayer with him, inviting him into your life, into your story. I encourage you to do that. It's a crazy story. It's a crazy story, but it has so much encouragement for us. Heavenly Father, please encourage us. Thank you for Esther. Thank you for choosing the unlikely. Thank you for choosing the voiceless, the victimized. Thank you for choosing people in your word, the underdogs like us, and using them in huge ways. As we go through this week, I pray that you would bring that sense of your presence into our stories and bring the peace that we need to know that you are still writing them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us. If you'd stand with me here this morning, John will be out in the lobby. You can talk to him if you're interested in helping out with the Grayson Project here. And we didn't even mention it, but it's on the back of your bulletin. Our monthly project for this month of, uh, of March is uh, Impact. I must personally act in several ways that you can financially participate in sharing uh, the good news or helping our youth or, or helping the poor or helping the victim, much like this story. God bless you. Have a great day. You're dismissed.